Kathy. Yeah, Kathy, Kathy said hi, everyone, but I didn't hear it. I think she can hear us, but um, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> she has been checking in yeah. and hearing it. So, Sandy, would you pray for us and pray for my cold? Uh, pray that I don't have to blow my nose 800 times <laughs> while I'm here. <laughs> Lord, thank you for this day of worship. Thank you that you have brought us all together here to hear more from you. Thank you for your word. We cannot live without it, Lord. We pray that you will uh, write it on our hearts. Mm -hmm. We bring it to mind. We put it on our lips and in our mouth at all times that we might have a word of encouragement for someone and a word of wisdom. I thank you for um, <clears throat> the teaching in this class. We are so new. Uh, we just pray, Lord, uh, that we will continue to move forward with you, <clears throat> go deeper. <clears throat> Lord, uh, we will never know it all in our <clears throat> lifetime. And we thank you. And we know, Lord, that um, your word predicts everything that is happening around us. Mm. And we have to be found faithful. Yes. Lord, we want to pray that we will be attentive. We pray for uh, Jeff, our teacher, that uh, this cold that has come mm. upon him will not interrupt his teaching or temper him in any way. We just pray that you will be the Lord, his healer, and Lord, that um, he will be filled with your spirit, and he will teach as you lead in God. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, thank, thank you so amen. much. It's a wonderful prayer. Okay, so if uh if you want to check out any of our past classes you can google born to believe by jeff smith youtube and my youtube channel is there and um all of, all of the past classes are there today we're going to try about trying to talk about the king james bible and after uh the king james bible dominated for 200 years um let me say that again. Really, the King James Bible dominated for at least 350 years. And if you're reading the Bible, an English-speaking person worldwide, your chances are you're reading a King James Bible. But that went away as we just look at the, the translations that you have in your hands today. Uh, that's changed. So uh, if we get there, but first we'll overview. Um, it's not my goal to simply give you a history lesson. These, these things that happen in history ought to inspire us to follow Jesus today. So even though it's history, boring, um, hopefully I can turn this into something that actually inspires you, inspires you to follow Jesus Christ. <laughs> Just talk to most of my kids. So if you're upset about anything that I say, this is my contact information. It's the same that's in the, that, that is in the church directory. Um, feel free to give me a call and people have. So um, our Old Testament manuscripts, we have, we have to go almost basically a thousand years after Jesus before we have a complete Old Testament manuscript. We have others that are partial transcripts, and now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls that, that give us partial manuscripts of almost all of the books of the Old Testament that, you know, are dated around, you know, a couple hundred years before Jesus. But we don't have a complete Old Testament manuscript until a thousand years after Jesus. That is problematic. Um, there, I've tried to give you good reasons to believe that uh, even though 
we don't have a complete manuscript, we have good reason to believe that it was transmitted faithfully down through the centuries. The writing of the New Te the 27 New Testament documents. So Jesus died around 30 AD. By around 48 AD, Paul writes the letter to the Galatians. And all of these dates are what typical evangelical conservative scholars would give. I'm not trying to say these are the exact dates. What I am saying is there's good reason to place these documents around this time. And the, the divide between conservative scholarship who have a high view of the Bible and people who have a lower view of the Bible, almost always the people who have a lower view of the Bible would place the dating later but not that much later. Um, so by 58 AD, Paul's written 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Uh, 64 AD, he's writing the prison epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon. Why are they called prison epistles? <laughs> he was in prison. Um, by, by 67 AD, both Peter and Paul are killed by Nero. So they don't even live to see all of the documents written. Probably all of the all of the doc, document all of the gospels were written at least by 68 AD. And why I say that is because we know that the Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And there's no mention of that. And that's such a huge cataclysmic um, upheaval of the Jewish way of, of life and that almost for sure they would have they would have mentioned it. And all all the time in all the gospels, it's it's stated like the temple is still standing. So, you know, there's good reason to believe that all of the gospels were written before 70 AD. By 90 AD, John has written Revelation in that. Um, so 60 years after the death of Jesus, all of our 27 documents, we have good reason to believe that they've been written. Um, our earliest complete manuscripts of those documents, Codex, Codex Sinaiticus, 325 AD, Codex Vaticanus, 350 AD, so 300 years after <clears throat> Jesus, we have complete copies of the New Testament documents. Codex Alexandrinus, and then this, Codex Ephraim Receptus, the same guy discovered both of those. So Codex Sinaiticus and this one, Codex Ephraim Receptus, uh, were either discovered or transliterated by a guy named Constantine Van Tischendorf. Van Tischendorf. Um, so we we hopefully we'll get to we'll get to him later. Um, so these are really big uh, and important manuscripts. They're important because they have they contain most of the New Testament and they're very early. So last week we finally got, after all that, to the King James Bible published originally in 1611. You math whizzes, how many years ago is that? Over 400 <laughs> years ago. Over 400 years ago. Um I also asked you to fill out a survey so we could go directly and look at the King James Bible some more, or we could find out what you said on the survey. So if you, um, William Tyndale was the guy who start who's who started the translation from the original languages, Hebrew, Greek, into English. 
um, he, he lived 1494 to 1536. Why he is so important is because his vision was that, and this is this is a direct quote, I defy the Pope and all his laws, and if God spares my life here many years, I will cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than thou dost. dost. And so what he was saying is, if we translate the original languages into the into the common language of the person on the street, then they can read it for themselves. And that was a direct departure of the methodology of the Roman Catholic Church. Did that happen? Um, surprisingly enough, it was it was higher than what you would you would have thought. Um, and although we don't have necessary, and we're talking, we're talking England, right? We're not talking about Germany, France, we're talking about England. Uh, England, by and large, was a richer country. The, the, um, there was an upper class, but there was also a forming middle class. There were, a, there was a large, there was a large amount of trade that was developing. Right, middle class and stuff like that. Yeah, and because of that, there the typically the priests were better trained, and so a lot of the a lot of the problems that Europe was suffering, you know, the the problems inside the Roman Catholic Church, to some degree. The, that they weren't happening in England. England had a better trained clergy. They had a um, just a real, real, more robust way of handling things. So it wasn't it wasn't beyond the realm of possibility. So he and William Tyndale is killed. Uh, he is he is. First, he's strangled, then he's burned at the stake after he's dead because he translated the Bible into English. Um, a, two years after that, Henry VIII, who was the one who had, had him killed, William Tyndale killed, he authorizes the Great Bible. And it was basically William Tyndale's translation. So the great Bible would be in church, it was a big Bible, they would, they would typically chain it to the pulpit, right? But if you could read, you could go to church, and you could read it. Um, very expensive Bible because it's so big. Um, so Henry VIII died, his son Edward, uh, Mary knows this better than me. He uh, he ruled for about five years. He died. Uh, Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, ruled for another five years. So then Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, she comes to the to the throne about 1559 and rules to 1603. And under that, under her, she authorizes the Bishop's Bible. Okay. All of these are a retooling of William Tyndale's Bible. They, they, they start with Tyndale's Bible and they modify it a little bit. But now you have, you have English Bibles available. Uh, in 1560, the Geneva Bible, there were Protestant, so 1560, um, Bloody Mary is, is uh, queen in England, the, the people who are Protestants flee because she is trying to revert the, the Church of England back to Roman Catholicism under pain of death. And so uh, people in England flee, they go to Geneva where Calvin is, and they translate a English Bible, it's a Geneva Bible, and it, it is a Bible with notes. It's a steady Bible. And these notes say the most horrendous things like, um, the, I, I'm making this up, this is not a direct quote, but it's similar to what, it would say things like, the Pope is the spawn of Satan. Um, you know, I mean, it, it was not, 
they didn't mince words, right? The Bible propaganda. Um, <laughs> no, it was it was promoting a Protestant point of view. In a very acrimonious sort of way. So, um, for people who are using the Geneva Bible, you could tell why Queen Elizabeth was not a big fan of that, right? <laughs> because it was it was antithetical to a a ruler, um, a monarch who had un questioned power. Well, she was also trying to reverse the same as That was part of her what she was known for was, was trying to balance things because she was a very Yes, yes. And she was quite good at it, actually. Um, so, and, you know, she's, she's a Protestant. So she she authorized a you know the bishop's Bible, and you know there so the the word in English is now becoming available. What was excuse me just a second? What was the argument that the Pope and the Church gave for not wanting it translated in anything other than the Latin? Um. I mean, we know so that the motives power, you know, they want to control, but what what did they say in terms of the public rationale for not wanting to change? I, I'm trying to think of original documents and proclamations, and I don't, I don't, I can't think of any. Where were they? I, I think it falls more into the realm of we've been doing this for a thousand years. There's, we see no need to change it now. I, I would think they would want to also do the fact, not that, but they would probably use the rationale that we we have been given special insight by God because we're the priests and stuff like that, and, and you common people have done to it. And so we have to we have to interpret it for you. Which dovetails well with a king, a monarch who has, you know, basically unparalleled power over his people, right? Um, so it goes hand in hand. The Pope has unparalleled power and unquestioned power over the church. And that could dovetail well with a ruler over France or Germany or England who who doesn't want people questioning their power. So I can't think of a, of a doctrinal position, um, but they were, you know, a lot of this had, had developed literally over centuries. And so I, I can't give you a good answer of their line of reasoning of how they got there. There, there was a time there when people went that way. It was about why Sadie Blacks actually told a lot of stories because people could tell, could know the stories from the pictures that people couldn't see. Yes, um, especially you know, you know, Europe wide, you know, thousand eleven hundred A.D. Um, that that was very much the case, but now things have changed. For one thing. The, uh, the Black Plague has decimated the population of Europe. Because of that, the, the price of labor has, has went up. And now just a common laborer, now they've got real power. And there was the Peasants' Revolt in 13, both there was one in, in Germany right after Martin Luther, you know, around 1520. And there had been one previously in England uh, in the late 1300s, and so that that destroyed the um, the status quo in Europe, and so there there's a bunch of things that are that are coming together, and it's it's developed really more international trade and just trade in general, um, and that's gonna that's gonna escalate, that's gonna accelerate. Um, 
so it's no longer um, feudal agriculture where you've got a you've got a duke, he's got a castle, he's got a standing army of a few or a bunch of men, and then you've got serfs that surround him and he controls that. That that has died away by now. Um, so, um, the I, I want I want to read this uh, because this tells how monumental the King James Bible became. The eighty books of the King James Version included thirty nine books of the Old Testament an intertestamental section containing 14 books of what Protestants consider the Apocrypha, and 27 books of the New Testament. Noted for its majesty of style, the King James Version has been described as one of the most important books in English culture and a driving force in the shaping of the speak English-speaking world. A driving force in the shaping of the English speaking world. In other words, because of the King James Bible, it was modifying the culture. Do we have that type of clout in America today as Christians? No, that's gone. Um, <clears throat> had the Apocrypha, okay? wasn't until 40 years after it had been printed that they start taking it out because of concerns by the Protestants. Okay, so in 1604, King James, um, he calls this, this meeting Hampton Court. He, he has these, these Puritans who want some reforms. The only thing they get is a new Bible. And he gives them very specific instructions. This new Bible, they're going to start with the Bishop's Bible. It's not going to have any notes, you know, no, you know, the king is a spawn of Satan, you know, no notes like that. It's not going to have any notes. So all of this is, is politically motivated, okay? It's politically motivated. They knew that there was issues with their current translations, but he was very circumspect about what he was going to allow. And so they were going to start with the Bishop's Bible. 40 copies were printed in their loose leaf. So they, they formed three companies that were going to translate the Old Testament, two companies that were going to translate the, the, the 27 books of the New Testament, and one company that was going to translate the Apocrypha. That all happened in 1604. By 1611, it's all, pub it's all published. They've translated it, they've completed the work. Um, the notes of James Boyce, who was one of the final, um, he, was, he was on the final committee of how this would be translated. His notes on one of these 40, 40 copies of the, of the Bishop's Bible were, was found, and they're in Lambeth Palace in London. And the so we we have over the last 50 years, we have discovered a lot of things that give us insight into how the King James was published. Um, so the the King James is relying upon Erasmus's Greek New Testament. And I need to I need to clue you in on this because it's part of the story of why things eventually change. Um, let me back up. So, 1611, the King James Bible is published. It's also called the Authorized Version because the King authorized it. By 1800, it is the dominant Bible, and there wasn't ever any law saying you know you can't print any other Bible. It's just it took over. Um, the, the, the common people, if they were reading the Bible by 1800, it was a King James Bible mm -hmm. that you could probably still buy a Geneva Bible, but nobody did it. it, it so if you said the Bible, people knew exactly what you're talking about. 
Is that the case today? No, not at all. Okay. Um, how Erasmus's Greek New Testament um, informs our discussion about the King James Bible. You, you need to know this. So Erasmus was the first guy in, in 1516 to publish a Greek New Testament. And it was a diglot. It was uh, Latin on one side, Greek New Testament on the other. You know, so one page Latin, the other page is Greek. He only used eight Greek new uh, Greek manuscripts. How many do we have today? Over 5,000. He only used eight. One of them was had revelation. Only one of the eight had revelation. And it was missing the last the last page, so it was missing the last six verses. Mm -hmm. Causes problems. Um, so there is this guy, Constantine Van Tischendorf, born in 1815 to live to 1874 as a German. He wanted to scientifically prove that the text of the New Testament was faithfully translated. <clears throat> scientifically prove that the faith that the that the text of the new testament was faithfully translated so 1840 to 1843 he deciphered the code the codex ephraim receptus let me tell you about that that there's a cover there's a part of it how well can you read that okay so let me tell you a little bit of the history of this so they had a they had a manuscript it it uh somebody decided we don't need that and so they washed the ink off of it mm -hmm. <laughs> and they cut it up and they made a brand new book okay because they needed the materials but you could still kind of read some of the text underneath See this stuff? And without a microscope, without good lighting, he was able to decipher that. And, and um, Dan Wallace, he tells the story. He, he went and he was trying to decipher one of these lines. He was, he was trying to check out one thing. And he's going, I couldn't read any of it. Um, but what he came up with is a very ancient, you know, around 500 AD um, manuscript is a very important manuscript. And it's, it doesn't, it doesn't quite cover the, all of the New Testament, but it covers a lot of it. He was able to do that. So this Tischendorf, so he, he decodes the Codex Ephraim Receptus, and he discovered the Codex Sinaiticus. So this Codex Sinaiticus, that's another one of, that was dated 325. Very, very important manuscripts. Tischendorf was the guy who came up, gave us both of those. Um, so he, he is incredibly, and he is incredibly important. And then on top of that, he ran all over the Mediterranean world, finding and discovering new manuscripts. So he, he was very important as far as for the manuscripts he's discovered, but also he was very important because he developed rules to help us decide what textual variant is the original. So he, he was able to start postulating, okay, based on what we've seen all of these scribes do, um, the shorter reading is typically the better reading, okay? You know, and he was able to postulate stuff like that. So he's very important. Um, notice he dies in 1874. So by the 1870s, um, it, it's becoming clear that the text, the Texas Receptus, the, the, the groundwork of what we got the King James from, has big problems. Didn't it didn't use enough uh, manuscripts? It didn't use a wide enough variety of manuscripts. There there are some serious problems. 
Tischendorf developed a he he um he publishes a Greek New Testament. Um 1862, Tischendorf published a critical text that showed variants in an apparatus at the bottom. You, you're not going to be able to see this. But so this is a Greek, this is a diglot also, okay, Greek here, English here. And this has an apparatus and it has marks here in the Greek, you know, say, okay, and it doesn't spell this out. You have to know how to read the marks and you'll have an O, okay, O means this word was omitted, one word. Um, and down here, it'll, it'll list, okay, these texts omit it, these texts have it. Um, he, Tischendorf, was one of the first people to start writing a, an apparatus and discussing, you know, and giving you right there on the Greek page what, what uh, manuscripts had what readings. So it's just incredibly important as far as our study of the Greek New Testament. So by 1870, it's clear that the Textus Receptus, originally from Erasmus's Greek New Testament in 1516, the, the Textus Receptus is not the best text. By 1870, that's clear. Okay, let's let's actually read the Bible. So I want you to read, I want you to open your Bible if you brought one. If not, we can just read this. There you go. Um, how's it happening in there? Okay. Um, turn to First John 5, 7, and 8. First John 5, 7, and 8. I have the text here. Um, but I want you to read some of your Bibles. What, what Bible do you have, Marilyn? Yes, me. Okay, you, okay, so you... I've got the one over there. You've got this one. Mary, you've got a new King James. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you read, you read 1 John 5, 7, and 8. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these things agree as one. Hmm. How much of that did you have, Marilyn? Only what children. Huh. That's a problem. And by 1870, at least the, the, the New Testament scholars knew about these problems. Okay. So, just in this room, if we're going to tell unbelievers that they need to read their Bible, which Bible? Do we go with Mary's Bible? And 2006, we had Dan Brown make a whole movie about stuff like this. We had Bart Ehrman write a New York bestseller that sold millions of copies that talked about just exactly that. So come on, tell me. I'm an unbeliever. You tell me which Bible I ought to read. Because I know about this. You wouldn't know about that. I would. Why would you know about that? Because if you watch anything on the History Channel, you're going to know about stuff like this. Because they always have the most... Um, In other words, skepticism. You're going to be skeptical. All right. Exactly. All right. There are whole There are whole web pages that... The, they they bring up Dan, they bring up Dan Wallace and they said this is why it's wrong. Well, the only thing I can think of this is that in the scientific community, if you read Indian scientific literature, they believe that the giant apocalypse of the Cambrian was because of a volcano. If you read Western 
scientific literature they believe it's an asteroidal event in the Caribbean. So when I say, when someone asks, well, which science book should I read? I don't really care. Why, Why not? Really care? Why don't you care? Because in the end, it doesn't matter. The detail didn't matter. It's the core concepts that matter and the core concepts are going to be the same. Yeah. But if we say our unity is based on inerrancy, which Bible? We have to decide which Bible. It depends on your definition of inerrancy because that can get you into a little bit of a pickle. Um, our son went to a church for some while where the pastor was just adamant they would only use the King James Version. Exactly. And that's exactly, this verse is why they say that. This is why they say that. Okay. As a church, have we adapted to discuss problems, well-known problems like this, so we can give credible answers to our culture? Well, the difference is, is that I think we can get ourselves into a situation where we worship the Bible rather than the God of the Bible. And so it's important to make that distinction when we talk to people about what the Bible tries to communicate. It's the import of the Bible, not the words themselves that have the power. Well, we should, I shouldn't say it that way. It's the spirit behind the words yeah. that has the power, not the words themselves. The, the doctrine of inerrancy is the verbal... Mm -hmm. <laughs> meaning the words the verbal inspiration of verbal plenary meaning all of it inspiration of the text in the original manuscripts well I, I can see where you're going I do know that Pastor Mark and Pastor Matt especially will bring up some of the textual differences while they're preaching on certain things and then they will clarify what the important thing is about it. Because they do bring up the textual differences. And it's fun. So enjoy them. <clears throat> okay. This is a problem. It's becoming, because of the internet and um, active, active atheists or agnostics who are preaching to the word, the, about the word, about the problems with the Bible, Bart, Bart Ehrman, um, there's a lot, of, lot more people that know about this stuff. So, by 1881, the, there's a Greek New Testament that was published and it is a critical text so it takes the readings and of many of the available manuscripts and it departs from the textus textus receptus okay 1881 so by by the late 1800s it's clear we've got to come up with better ways of of interpreting all of these different manuscripts and arriving at a conclusion about them. Um, 1881, the English Revised Version is published. Um, by 1952, there is a Revised Standard Version, and it's the first to use the Isaiah Scroll from the Dead Seas. And it, in, in Isaiah 7.14, and this is Isaiah 7.14, it, it translated the word Alma, Hebrew word Alma, as young woman, okay? This is the New American Standard, Isaiah 7.14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Does that sound familiar? Quoted Matthew Luke. Okay. Um, 
if you put in young woman instead of virgin, uh-oh. But you know what the Hebrew word means? No, um, it's possible, but clearly in this, in this, you know, if you go read Isaiah seven, um, the the sign, Isaiah's wife probably becomes pregnant, and has a son. Yeah, but fourteen is a quote from from New Testament, right? From yes. Yeah. This no, this this is the Isaiah passage. Oh, that's the Isaiah passage. But it's quoted in in Matthew. So how is it quoted in Matthew? So Matthew is quoting the the LXX, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. the The word there, a Greek word, means virgin. So he's in, the inspired. If, you, if that's the original text of the gospel. The spirit inspired him to say virgin, which he interpreted from and took from Isaiah. In other words, the, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. The, the 1952 Revised Standard Version, this leaves open the possibility of a virgin, but it does not nail it down, right? It does not specifically say this is a virgin. But the New Testament does nail it down. It does. And because of the backlash of this in 1952, that spawned all of our modern translations. That's a little bit simplistic. Um, you got to remember, so there's Old Testament stuff happening. We have Dead Sea Scrolls. We're finding all kinds of uh, more manuscripts. So there's there's archaeological stuff happening that we know about. There's archaeological stuff happening, Im impacting the manuscripts that we have for the Greek New Testament. Um, and some of it's very early, like that little uh, credit card size papyri of John chapter 18, you know, that was a papyri. So we, we're finding more stuff by 1952, we, we have no longer one translation. Now, there, there is becoming all kinds of translations. Yeah. yeah. What did, when, can we go back a second? What did you mean when you said there was a bunch of backlash? Can you be more specific about that? What did that mean? So the backlash is exactly what Mike was saying. Hey. You can't translate it like that <laughs> um, because if that's a young woman and then the in the New Testament, it says it's a virgin. Yeah. And so um, there was a pastor who made, I, I think, national headlines that said he was going to burn a copy of the Revised Standard Version in his church service over stuff like this. So there was internally, right? I mean, there were just huge backlash, huge debate. Um, and you gotta remember what's been king all these centuries before. King James Bible. And now you got a new one and it's wrong. And whole denominations have developed theology that supports exactly that premise. And that's why you ought to read only the King James. I don't agree with that. Okay, you gotta remember, so to put this in context, this, the young woman allows for the virgin. The virgin, is clear in the Greek text. And in that particular instance, that fulfillment, Jesus was born of a virgin. So all of this on our crucial um, 
our crucial beliefs, our crucial doctrines, who Jesus is, he's God, he's fully God, he's fully man, uh, his virgin birth, his death, his resurrection, none of those things are, are destroyed by textual variants. None of them. They're, they're not significantly altered. Um, if, if we didn't, you know, getting back here to the, the textual <coughs> issues with 1 John 5, 7, and 8, the, the big debate about whether or not Jesus was God or a created being happened in the, the Arian debate in 200s. They didn't have this verse, right? They had that. And they, if they would have had this, they would have quoted that. But even so, they still became very clear, <clears throat> Jesus is God. He's fully God and he's fully man. Um, <coughs> these textual variants, even though you can make a lot of them, you know, you can make a great big deal about them, on the core tenets of Christianity, they don't, they don't have an impact. Um, so, the King James is coming under more and more under attack. By 1971, you have the New American Standard, NASB. And these, why I mention these? So, these have different translating philosophies, okay? So, the New American Standard tried to keep as close to the word-for-word -word translation. Now, that's impossible. You can't have a word-for-word -word translation. Um, but they tried to keep as close as possible a word-for-word -word translation and even the same word order, if possible. And it's not. Um, the New International, they, they had a principle that they called dynamic equivalent. And so they would say, okay, this phrase is trying to communicate this in English. And so they wouldn't try to have a word-for-word -word and keep the same word order. That it's a more free translation, okay? And if you read the, if you read the forewords, you know, the big introductions on, on these Bibles, they'll tell you all this. Um, the 1982, the New King James Version, it was, it was an entirely different philosophy. Their, their philosophy was, we're keeping the King James. We're just updating it, including, including the textual, okay, so just to give you clarity on this, um, this in yellow should not be there, okay? No New Testament scholar says that in yellow, which is in your Bible, Mary, ought to be there. And the reason is, is because all the manuscripts that we have are after Erasmus, and, and they, it was a corruption from the Latin Vulgate. So... This shouldn't be there, but in the New King James, it, it's there. They kept it because the, the, the philosophy of the New King James Version was we're, we're going to update spelling. We're going to update um, the... Basically, English. Yeah. My my Bible does have notes about that word, so it has you know the right reference in the original. Right. Oh, so one of the drawbacks of the King James is it it has verses. It doesn't have it arranged in paragraphs. Um. All modern translations they arrange it in paragraphs. Um, if you buy a study Bible, then you've got notes. So, well, it also has a very limited lexicon, too. I mean, that was one of King James's um, demands that the number and kind of words are reduced. I, I don't know about that. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very good at 1611 English. Come to think of it, I'm not very good at 2020 English. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it is so, <laughs> so, there. There, there are many, many other translations, and basically, you know, they're coming from nineteen around nine. 
the the they got kicked off in the 1960s by 1970s you know they're starting to be published and it just picked up steam from there so um my goal is still to inspire you okay nine out of ten people in eastern oregon go to kid church would you like to find out what our survey said? So last week, I put up this survey. <clears throat> How long have you attended any church? How long have you attended First Baptist? Rate your satisfaction. Is there anything that would cause you to deeply uh, doubt your faith? Average answer of how long people have attended First Baptist. And there was two people who I put down for two months. <laughs> Because that's what you put. 28 years. That's older than my oldest of four kids. That's longer than the entire life of my young, of my oldest son. Um, take a guess. Satisfaction. What number? So there was one five. There was a 10 plus, but I just put that down as a 10. The average is 8.2. What does that tell you about our satisfaction level with the way things are right now? Happy. Very, very happy. We wouldn't be going here otherwise, probably. Yeah. If we gave this exact same survey to the 200 people at left, what do you think their answer would be? <laughs> Over over two hundred people left our church over the last two and a half years. They can get upset by one issue, and all the exactly. rest was fine. Exactly. That's too. That's so broad. It is. I'm yeah. only satisfied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any reason. I, I I'm sure there are. Yeah, there are. I, I I'm sure there's bunches of them. I just I I'm arguing that we ought to try to find out what those reasons are. That's my argument. I, I, not that they're right. I'm not arguing that they're right. I'm arguing we ought to know. We did a a, did. a lot of personal contacting right. after right. Um, right. after we saw kind of a drop, and I know we reached out to people. We talked to people personally about what and so forth. So I know there was a, a concerted effort by the whole church to do that yes. to figure it out. Yeah. Um, is there anything that would cause you to deeply doubt your faith in God? No. And it was, everybody said no. Um, if nine out of 10 people have, you know, don't go to church in the area, do you think that they probably have doubts about that? Mm -hmm. Urgency of the need to know that. I totally agree. <laughs> you, you, I, I'd like to go back to what I said about Ukraine a couple Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. Now, Fort Worth has a is a deep well to draw people from that we don't have here in Oregon. But if you want to see a really good Baptist church in operation, take a look at its website. Unfortunately, you got to get back and get the previous um, meetings because um, they're over, their their service overlaps with. Well. Um... 
the culture in Fort Worth, Texas is, is, which is part of the Bible Belt, is entirely different than what Eastern Oregon is. And so let me let me make this point. How long have you attended church? This is what people said all my life. 100 percent everybody said i was shocked i nearly fell off my chair <laughs> okay all my life so this is this is the people that we have in our church and so this ought to be our target target audience people who have attended church all of their life and don't have any doubts about that <laughs> I have a little caveat. If you've attended church all your life, <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily mean that you know the Lord. I, I didn't say it did. I know, but just to clarify that, I've attended church all my life, but I didn't come to know the Lord until I was in college. So, you know, there is a little caveat. This tells us that the way we choose to do things attracts people who have attended church all their life. Of course, this class is a real special subset of the church, too. It's, so, not, a, it's not a random sample. Right. Okay, so we've got, we've got new people. Yeah, but it's not random, Joe. I'm not saying that it yeah. is. So if, if we're not content with this, what could we do? I think we always need to evaluate the ministry constantly. Our, our message doesn't change, but how we go about it. And it's just like I talked to you about last week, how when I first started coming here back in like 78 or 79, it is completely different. <laughs> and it's just because our, our culture and our different tone. So we always have to be evaluating. We always have to be looking at what we need to make it you know, more outreach and everything else. We should never stay the same. But, so... Uh, what should what should our next steps be? I, I'm totally I totally agree with you, Laura. We need to start evaluating. Well, if you look at the yeah. parents of the Heidi Ho kids, for example, they are that is not their demographic. Right. Heidi Ho parents are half of them are non-believers and don't have a church. So it seems like they're in our church building constantly. That would be a perfect outreach opportunity for us. Well, they, it's only going to be a perfect outreach if we change the way we do church. Right. What I'm saying is because that's a strategy. Because right now we have a church that only people who have went to church all their life go to. Well, we don't know that. Okay, so how could we find out? We talk to people. <laughs> In our neighborhoods. Why not Why neighborhood. not have the leaders of our church, every Sunday they tell us, fill out this form, every Sunday. Why not next Sunday we have them fill this out? Oh. Who thinks that's a good idea? You got to vote. Either that's a good idea or a bad idea. You got to vote. So I'm gonna I'm asking first, who thinks that's a good idea? Might be. Okay, we got well put your hand up. Half hand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we <laughs> Laura, you in or you out? I'm in half. No? <laughs> it's either in or it's out. Okay, now the people who think that's a bad idea, you raise your hand. You raise your hand. How many do you think would answer those? <laughs> okay. So the people who raise their hands, I have a copy. And you guys need to get together and take it to our leadership and have them. The only it's entirely the same. It's entirely the same, except for I added age and and um because we need to know what age they are and um whether male or female. That's exactly the same. Laura, you talked about evaluating. Mm -hmm. We've got to do this. But we do do it. No, we don't. What do you want us to do with these? Take it to the leadership. Ask them to, to have a church-wide survey. 
have a churchwide survey and let's find out. Do we really have a church that you have to have attended church all your life to go to? You don't know that. That's why I'm asking you, please go to our church leadership and ask them to do a survey. That's evaluating. That's evaluating. People are afraid of that. Now, most of you guys took the survey. Have you had post-traumatic stress disorder since then? <laughs> did, did, it, did it cause any un, unexplained illnesses? You got cold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's on you guys. You need to go to our church leadership and ask them, please, please in the next couple of weeks, pass out the survey, have them do it right, just two minutes. It'll only take two minutes. Okay. You, you have to follow, follow the outcome then. So, all right. And then see. share the outcome. All right. So then we have an outcome. What do we do with it? Okay. <laughs> we'll have some idea of whether or not people really, the reason why you guys are re reticent to do this is because you're satisfied. You're very satisfied. The, re the problems that we are having are not rocket science. For people who study churches, the, the problems that we have are glaring. And your reticence and our leadership's reticence to be actively doing this on an ongoing basis, that's a big problem. Have you been to the leadership? Have you talked with them about this? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> and we're praying for you. <laughs> I I deeply appreciate it. And you know my my contact information. I I am dead serious. If you have a, if you have, if you have a problem with me, please call me up. Um. I think honestly, I think what you're doing is bringing us to issues that we don't always uh, acknowledge. And so, in, in saying I'm praying for you, I'm not praying for you because you're way out here. I'm praying for you because this all needs to be prayed over. Carol, if I didn't have a cold right now, I'd come over and give you a hug. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I, thank you so much. I, oh, God. I'm such a wreck. <laughs> um, but Carol's praying for me, so there is hope. Mm -hmm. And Father, there's hope for all of us. Because Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us. And we need to tell people about that. Please help us. Please help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so, next week, we start the summer schedule, so no class. Um, and I'm not sure what they have planned for the fall. But uh, I'm sure we'll find out soon. So, God bless you. Thank you, Joe. Thank for you for the opening this honestly, can. Thank you. <laughs> Even though the worms are crawling all over the floor. <laughs> <laughs>